The title is The Investment Case for Climate Aware Food and Agriculture. What are the real returns that matter? To moderate this panel, I'm delighted to introduce Elizabeth Candelario. So please, Elizabeth, take the stage, the virtual one. Elizabeth has deep experience in both the nonprofit and the for profit sectors and believes passionately in the role of business to drive social mission. Prior to America, she served as the managing director of Demeter USA, the nation's only certifier of biodynamic farms and products, and a member of Demeter International, the oldest ecological certification organization in the world. Elizabeth, I'm so excited to have you with us. Thank you for moderating the session. And please, Nick and Esther, I'm inviting you now all on the stage. You're in Elizabeth's hand and have a wonderful time together. Thank you. Thank you, Angie, for that lovely introduction. And I'm very pleased to introduce our two fabulous panelists, Esther Parks and Nick McCoy. Esther is CEO at Cienega Capital. Sienica Capital is a family office investing to improve soil health, regenerative agriculture practices, and local food systems. She is also a board member of Eden Specialty Ciders, Civil Eats, Custom Food Holdings, and Carmen Ranch Provisions. Nick is co-founder of Whipstitch Capital, the largest independent mergers and acquisition and private placement advisory firm focused solely on the healthy living consumer market. Whipstitch has worked with some of the leading consumer brands, including Thayer's, Sunsweet, Uncle Matt's, and Kavita. He is an industry advocate in many initiatives, including sustainability and Jedi, and is a frequent contributor to New Hope's programs, particularly those with data-driven analysis. So welcome, panelists. Thank you. Let's start, let's start by focusing on the marketplace. If you want to, if we want to leverage the marketplace to accelerate climate solutions, we need investment in regenerative agriculture and climate friendly brands. Esther, I'm wondering, as an investor, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing farmers and smaller brands face and what advice are you giving them? Yeah, I think one of the things that um, it's really facing a lot of small farming and food enterprises is that a lot of our supply chain infrastructure is really created, has been created to um, favor big industrial ag. Um, so access to that infrastructure has been lacking. Um, and, and oftentimes they're often having to build their own infrastructure as they're building their company along. So there's a lot of extra cost that's involved in that. Um, and so one of the things that I've been telling some of my portfolio companies is, you know, if, if today you're a $5 million company and you're really struggling, um, what would it look like if you were a $10 million company or a $15 million company? What opportunities might there be for you to either merge with another company that's like you, um, that's maybe close to you, or what could it look like if there was some kind of collective? So if you got together with two or three other companies or two or three other farms in your region, what kinds of things could you access with your collective um, sort of buying power and revenue share and things like that? So I think that, you know, if on one hand we want to try to compete in, in this industrialized um, food marketplace, there needs to be more of that happening so that there can, they, they can exercise a bit more muscle in the marketplace. Um, but I also have been encouraging uh, my companies to really tap deeply into the direct consumer. Um, because like I said, you know, the, the food system is not built for them. And so, you know, trying to compete for their place in grocery stores um, can often be really, really hard. Um, grocery stores are not their friends. They're not um, necessarily promoting their, um, their values. Um, and it's really more about the bottom line for those grocery stores. They have to deal with their own economics, right? And so oftentimes they're not necessarily looking for, uh, looking out for the smaller farms and far, far, uh, smaller brands. And so, um, you know, what kinds of better attachment to value can you get through direct to consumer types of activities? Um, so 
Uh, we're also struggling. I, there was some conversation earlier about labels, and I think that's just another piece of the conversation um, that we're just we're struggling a little bit with labels um, and adherence, um, monitoring, enforcement, <laughs> co-opting, all of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, so to the extent that they can have a direct relationship with the consumer, oftentimes the labels, you know, will mean less in that case. I love that idea of direct to consumer because it so collapses the supply chain. And I wanted to ask you, Nick, what are some of the inherent roadblocks that the supply chain throws into the mix? And how can investment capital be used to eliminate those roadblocks and also increase the sustainability and resilience of the supply chain? Uh, it's a great question, Elizabeth. And it's actually a very broad question uh, because the, the supply chain itself needs to evolve to a point of regenerative agriculture from where it is now. And that can be very complicated. It can be different in Kansas than it can be in California where there's a lot less water. So the conversion process can take much, much longer. And you know, the soil itself can be much more vulnerable. Uh, just if, if you're thinking about large CPGs, there may not be enough ingredient availability reliably today for them to change a brand over to a regenerative you know, supply chain. It just may not be out there, practically speaking, yet, or at least with enough redundancy that they're comfortable. From the consumer end, it's a premium product, and people need to understand the value. And, you know, farmers need to be paid for that premium. They need to make a real margin and make, you know, enough money that it's a viable business uh, so that there, some more farms are encouraged to move over. <clears throat> um, and then, you know, as far as what can be done on it, you know, investment capital can help companies uh, more closely enable, you know, kind of align with a, a triple P or, a, you know, people profits planet business model. Uh, and there's some customer education that has to happen there for farmers. It can help them make the bridge from where they are now to a, a more regenerative and, you know, sustainable farm. Well, let me ask both of you, how can investment capital be used to increase consumer demand? I mean, Nick, you just mentioned the, the importance of the consumer. How, how can we increase consumer demand for regeneratively farmed meat, produce, and ingredients? And what do we need to be talking to consumers about? And who is responsible for educating them? Either one of you can go first. <laughs> well, I'll jump in, Esther, you can, you can hop on. Um, <clears throat> I think from the consumer side, uh, there needs to be some education and people understand organic but regenerative agriculture is kind of a, a big complicated word and it's really hard to simplify. Um, if, you know, I, I bet you if you went into Whole Foods and you took a poll of 20 people, you would probably get 15 different answers. Um, it's, just, it's, it's just not easy. So part of that comes from increased availability, the more products that are out there and the more that you see the term and you know, uh, news about it, just the more education that's out there. Uh, companies marketing, you know, right now social media is out there. That wasn't around in the 80s when organic came out. So, you know, that increases the the education rate. And actually, I think even with COVID, the amount of nodes and kind of interactions between consumers with all these Zoom meetings and, you know, electronic communication is higher. And perhaps that can help, you know, the viral spread too. Um, you know, I, I think there's an economic case for brands to kind of embrace sustainability early on too. And uh, I think that's really important because you can't go back and change your brand ethos, um, but you can certainly you know, change it and you can deepen it very early on to one of sustainability. Well, you're putting a lot of um, responsibility on the brands. Esther, do you agree with that? Do you think that brands are really responsible for educating consumers? And do you have any other comments about that? Yeah, I mean, I do think that brands, they're, they're often the front line with the consumers. And so that's the interaction that a lot of consumers have with it. And so, you know, like Nick was saying, um, we've been working actually with a communications firm through, um, through a nonprofit that I work with. And um, they're finding that most people don't know what regenerative is. They've never heard that term or they have no idea what it means. And so, you know, that sort of like long road to try to get people educated. I think one of the things that's really missing from the dialogue that all of us can kind of pitch in on is just the, the binary thing that's going on right now. Um, and I think that social media is great because there's so many different avenues for more communication. But the downside of that is it's very short form communication. And so often things, 
oftentimes things get reduced down to binaries. Um, but regenerative ag and, it, and, and climate smart ag, frankly, is a much more nuanced conversation. So where are the places where we can have that more nuanced conversation versus like just the, the binary? This is good, this is bad, um, because there's a spectrum and there's nuance and there's a lot of different factors around it that we need to have that discussion about. So I don't know if social media is the right place to have that, um, but I, I definitely think that you know films like Kiss the Ground and um, Gather which have both recently come out, are really great ways um, to start engaging people in those kinds of conversations. It's really interesting how traditional media doesn't even show up. And I wish I had the statistic at my at, 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 on hand, but the Hartman Group had a really interesting research paper that came out not too long ago. And it said that the number one way that consumers are learning about sustainability is through brands. I mean, when we were growing up, we read magazines and watched National Geographic. It's a whole different world out there now. And I really agree with you that, like it or not, brands uh, really do have a lot of responsibility for educating consumers. Well, I want to move into a topic that is of particular interest to me these days, and that's around climate showing up on the balance sheet. The impacts of climate change are already affecting companies' bottom lines with increasing climate disasters like wildfires, drought, flooding, and heat waves that threaten business operations internationally. The result is that many investors are now choosing to channel funds into investments that address climate change risk, not because consumers are asking them or because they want to be good neighbors, but because not doing so directly impacts their profitability. Last year, investors put $20.6 billion into funds that focused on ESG, environmental, social, and government governance issues, quadrupling the record from the year before. Bank of America estimates that in the next two decades, there will be over $20 trillion of asset growth in ESG funds, in which climate change is a major component. So Esther, let me ask you, how do you see this impacting financial investment in climate aware food? Yeah, so there's a there's a lot of money pouring into, you know, ESG, SRI, pick your acronym. Um, and there's a lot more interest in understanding what the climate impacts of investments are. I think one of the things to just watch out for is that, you know, um, just like with water, you know, on a landscape, like too much at once is not healthy. <laughs> and so as we sort of see this flood of capital coming in, we have to really ask ourselves, like, what is it really going towards and what is it really changing? Because I feel like um, a lot of that capital is really just primarily return seeking. And so in return seeking, oftentimes they're going towards uh, solutions that I, I believe are, are wrongheaded in many ways. Um, so, you know, a lot of this, uh, this fake meat that's out there, you know, we see a lot of like plant-based uh, food solutions as being the, the solution to climate change um, and carbon markets is also being another one. And I think, you know, on the surface of it, it sounds good. It sounds like we're helping the climate, but I think if you really dig underneath those, um, they're, <clears throat> they're not necessarily the solutions that we need. Um, a lot of investment tends to chase after the, the, the end of the bad effects. So once we've ruined the climate, how do we start to um, fix all the problems that it has created? As opposed to really thinking about, well, what are the root causes? How did we get there in the first place? And what are the kinds of things upstream that we need to think about um, to invest in to prevent you know, climate change from accelerating and to even reverse it. Um, so I just think that um, there's, there's such a different mentality that we need to engage in um, to really think about how these investments can positively affect the climate. Um, so these Band-Aid solutions probably generate the most returns actually, right? Mm -hmm. So like if you think about all the problems with uh, drinking water, nitrogen, over nitrogenation of water, um, too much phosphorus, creating these algae blooms. We saw a few years in Ohio how drinking water was really um, badly affected. They basically had to shut off drinking water um, because it was so badly polluted. And so all of the investment dollars wanted to go towards 
solutions and technologies that cleaned the water, as opposed to why did that water get so polluted in the first place? <laughs> Right, and so the solution is actually upstream at the farm level. So what are the farmers doing and why is all that crap that they're putting on their farms, mm -hmm. um, you know, going into the drinking water? Well, the solutions for that kind of thing and the investment for that kind of thing doesn't generate the kinds of returns that a tech-based solution for cleaning water at the other end um, makes. And so, you know, I think investors have to really think about like, what is, what are we really going for and what is the balance of the return versus sort of like creating a system that doesn't get us to this place anymore? That is a fantastic answer and it's like um, beware greenwashing even in finance, which is happening yeah. happens in a lot of examples we were just talking about. You know, Sue Ronald Cohen just published a great book that I highly recommend. It's called Impact, Reshaping Capitalism to Drive Real Change. And he makes the case that governments need to mandate that companies publish impact-weighted accounts that take into account their ESG performance. So Nick, I'd like to ask you, what other systematic changes are needed to encourage transparency, assess environmental impacts, and reduce risk? Um, great question, another broad one. Uh, on the consumer side, we need more understanding, and I think that means we need labeling that people can quickly get in a conventional grocery store in two seconds on the shelf. The word organic works very well. People know the word, and but you can't write organic 2.0, and you can't explain everything about regenerative agriculture on a label, so people need to understand it very simply. And that brings you to farms, which really need testing, and it can't be testing that is a burden. It has to be simple and easy and something that can feed that label so that you know, there's transparency through the supply chain in a very small amount of space in the label. <clears throat> um, I think economically, when we're talking about systematic things, we also need to adopt a longer term viewpoint on economic policy. If we look long term, we have 11.5% of the world's arable land and we're forecast to have 4% of the population. When you net that out, we're gonna be in a position to be the biggest trade exporter or you know, exporter of food products. And that's really powerful, especially when you look at last month when we actually had our highest ever trade deficit in goods and our 16 year high on goods and services. So th this, this is something that should be very important and unifying to all parties. Thank you. Let's move into the topic of justice, equity, diversity and inclusion that certainly is a big topic at this conference and an emerging focus in the natural products industry. Esther, in, in our preparation for this conversation, I was very curious about your suggestion that we should start thinking about this topic by examining how indigenous cultures around the world have pra practiced ecologically appropriate agriculture. Tell us what can that teach us as we all do a lot of soul searching and learning around these Jedi principles. Yeah, I think that um, it's important for us to really think about the frames in which we understand the world um, and which frames are helpful to us and which frames are not. Um, and so um, I think that if, if we settle into, and, and some of this is so innate because we grew up in this culture, right? So we're embedded and, and steeped in this culture that we often don't realize that we're thinking in these frames, but like, the, the sort of linear one dimensional, you know, patriarchal kind of thinking is focusing on financial return, measuring impact metrics and relying on empirical data um, and one directional management practices. Um, and, you know, this is, this is normal for our society and for the culture that we live in. And so sometimes it's hard to recognize the fact that we're stuck in that, but it's also important to recognize that that's what got us here in the first place. So how can we start to think differently and how can we um, learn from indigenous cultures? And when I say indigenous, not just indigenous in the US, but indigenous in Africa and Asia, right? And so um, there's this concept called concentric ecology, um, which is that, you know, we're not here to master um, the master nature and sort of like mine the soil to get whatever we need out of it. Concentric ecology is more about, we are just one element of an ecosystem of, you know, and, and one 
that is not necessarily dominant over, say, water, trees, animals, all these kinds of things. Um, and so if we thought in a, in a concentric way, what would that look like? Um, and just some of the thoughts that I have on that is, you know, focus on being in harmony with nature, um, observing and reacting, giving and receiving to the landscape, um, and acknowledging and valuing other ways of knowing, right? We're so dead set on putting a number to everything in this culture, but, you know, but there are other ways of knowing that something is true, that something is working, that something is, um, you know, something is happening and it can't always be reduced to a number. So how can we value other ways of acknowledging and, and knowing that things are true? Um, so I think that if we're gonna make this shift that we need to center the peoples and the cultures and the ways of thinking um, to get us to a different end, right? Um, so, you know, and this, it's all wrapped up in climate because because again, it's sort of that traditional thinking that got us to this place, so. Esther, that's really beautiful. Esther, that's and I really appreciate you how you, in thinking thing about things, you go back to the source. That's just two times in a row that you've spoken. It's like, let's look at the root of where this is coming from, where the source, fantastic. Thank you so much. Nick, let me ask you, what is the financial case for investment dollars to be channeled to companies that have these principles as core values? Is there any data that supports the inclusion of JEDI goals from an investment standpoint? There is. There is. Actually, it's pretty interesting. If you look back in early June, Ben and Jerry's put out a solidarity statement, and that was on June 3rd. And then in the next 45 days, looking at their sales in spins, you can see they picked up about $21 million of incremental sell-through. And that's a brand that from day one has had in its brand ethos that it's got a triple P or people, pro you know, profits planet business model. And other brands can't pull that off like they can. They didn't do it for profit. They did it because it was very genuine and authentic in the brand. Um, if you look at the analog of, you know, the broader economy, the World Economic Forum put out a report in 2019 ranking all the countries on gender neutrality. And if you look at the US, we're number 53. If you look at the top five, the top five over index us in, in GDP gains over 20 years. And some of those are, you know, most of them are developed countries. Um, so it's not like we're pulling from, you know, a batch of undeveloped countries, which naturally have higher growth rates, you know, European countries included. Um, I think there's a rising tide right now uh, in consumer companies for, a, you know, people profits planet, a holistic business model. You know, you see the millennials demanding that uh, and you can kind of see more and more companies embracing it. And even those that kind of started more partially that way, embracing it more broadly. I also think that, you know, with the shifts in the population right now, you know, we're 40% we're um, non-white right now. That number is increasing very, very quickly. And, you know, as that does that, we're going to have more demand for multicultural food. And, you know, you're already just starting to see in spins data now, some brands that are, you know, truly authentic that way, getting incremental gains. And it's, it's very hard, you know, to Esther's point, it's very hard to put numbers on this because, you know, these things are very long-term trends, um, but the demand is going to be there, particularly as we start to close the economic and education gaps. Okay. Now here's another question for both of you. I love the idea of big levers. So I wanted to ask each of you, what do you think one of the biggest levers are that we have to work with to encourage investment in climate friendly food? Esther, I'll call on you first. Yeah, it's so it's so hard because as I said before, you know, it's not gonna be the lure of financial returns. It's just not, at least in the short term. Um, so I think it's just going to have to be our future generations. I mean, I think this year more than ever, it's really caused us to think about what kind of world we're leaving to our next generation, you know, and I actually get really sad and choked up when I think about my kids and the world that they're going to have to, you know, grow up in and um, potentially lead to their kids. And so, like, if that is not motivation enough, I mean, it just it has to be. So in essence, you're saying it's our own personal values that should be motivating us to make this, these changes. Nick, what do you have to say? Agree completely with Esther. And I have those thoughts go through my head as I look at my own kids. So I, 
I, I think that's that's probably one of the most powerful things that everybody in you know in the world can unite on right there, which I think is great. Um, you know, I think if if you look at uh, the kind of supply and demand around climate family food, you know, right now, um, if well, if you think broadly, when supply and demand are in balance, that's when you have the most you know basically the most money or most efficiency in a market. That's you know that's when the most transactions happen and and people are making you know a, a profit and things. And right now it feels like the demand is a bit off. The uh, if you look at farmers, um, they are not able to convert you know in droves here to regenerative farming. It's you don't see them kind of stampeding that way. And you know the ones that are, you know, there's still subsidies. They're they're not making a product and reliably selling it for the profit that they need to make to continue building their farm. So I think in the near term, uh, the biggest lever we have is increasing demand and our industry is in a great position to do that. Uh, we have you know, lots of companies that are being formed every day and companies that are you know, out there now embracing sustainable supply chains and putting that in their social media and you know, getting that word out and, and blanketing grocery store shelves and you know, online with those products. And, and I think that's very powerful. It's gradual, to Esther's point, this, is not, you know, this isn't an overnight profit. This is a very long-term thing. But you know, we, we can't be intimidated by the size of the task at hand. And you know, we just have to keep marching forward, even if it feels like small steps. I'm probably going to get in trouble, but I really feel like the organic industry could be talking with a more unified voice. And especially in, in I live in London most of the time, and I really noticed when COVID hit, you had the governments of the UK um, that's very supportive of organic promoting organic food with one voice that represented organic across the country. And I think we really are missing the boat here. Languaging is so important and just wait to what happens with the word regenerative, because as you said, I think Esther, you made that point that, or no, Nick, you did in the Whole Foods. If you ask 15 people, they'd have 11 different answers for you. I lived in the world of biodynamic. We won't even go there. <laughs> um, but Nick, you, you referenced something that I wanted to talk about a little bit which I think is a big hurdle. And that's the lag time between a farmer making an investment to be more regenerative, whether that's by incorporating more biodiversity, bringing back watershed, you know, investing in, in non-GMO crops, bringing that soil back to life, producing these regenerative ingredients that years down the road, oh, now they might be starting to get a return. And you see companies like General Mills, Organic Valley, that are really trying to kind of narrow that gap. Do you guys have any, you know, think, think of replant capital that's very invested right now in looking at investing in farmers to farm more regenerative. I just was curious, do either of you have any comments about things that you're seeing where farmers can get paid prior to selling crops at a higher price that enables them to make these investments? I think that's, that's part of the problem, Elizabeth, is that there's not enough incentive at this point. You know, the way that the farm bill is written, the way that our crop insurance, which is the primary vehicle for subsidies these days for farmers, the way that it's all structured is all encouraging um, and supportive of the industrialized agriculture model. Um, and so I think Kat Taylor mentioned it earlier today, we are, we are working with um, a group in Washington, DC that's trying to get um, uh, a new type of crop insurance uh, passed um, or accepted um, that actually rewards farmers for conservation practices. Whereas now you actually get dinged and we've had farmers lose their crop insurance, you know, multiple times over the course of several years because, um, because of the rules um, and the rules did not um, reward them for doing things like cover cropping. They actually got penalized for co cover cropping. So they lost their crop insurance, you know, so the, the incentives are not in line. The system is totally rigged towards the industrialized system. And so we do need to figure out like, what are the ways that we can um, incentivize farmers to make these changes? And part of that is gonna be the marketplace, right? Because if you have in the Midwest, all these corn and soybean farmers 
all of that stuff is going to export, right? That's all being exported or it's going to non-human food sources. Um, and so like they're not growing real food for real people. Um, how do we incentivize to do them to do that? Especially if you're in a place where you're probably three or four hours from the next, you know, urban metro area. Um, so we need to create those markets. And I think, you know, GM and other some, some big companies have made some moves to try to incentivize their supplier farmers to make that change, which I think is one solution. And it's, it's part of the, um, it's part of the sort of economic play that needs to happen because they can make the switch, but if there's nowhere for them to sell that product, like they're not going to do that. They're not going to make the switch. Nick, do you have a comment? Any comments on that? I, I have seen um, a couple companies that have adopted a business model where they've been able to kind of make a turnkey solution for farmers um, that are regeneratively, you know, raising crops, animals, so you grow it and we'll basically kind of take care of the rest. And I, and I think having a reliable demand source is, is really powerful. Um, and I think kind of, you know, letting farmers focus on farming and, you know, everything there while being able to make, you know, to make a real, uh, a real return and, you know, a real price for what they're selling. You know, I think that's very important. And, and you know, it's great to see that model catching on. So we only have a couple minutes and I was just curious whether each of you could share an inspirational story where you've seen really successful in investment in climate friendly food. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, so we, we invested in a cattle rancher up in Oregon um, where there, uh, there's a confluence of things happening there. Um, there's uh, over irrigation going on there, which is unthinkable in California, but <laughs> up there, there's a there's an over irrigation problem, and there's also a problem around um, native habitat for salmon. So salmon is becoming an endangered species in some of the waterways there, um, and it's also endangering the the livelihood um, of some of the Native American tribes in that region. And so um, they they got together with some nonprofits and the local tribes um, to sort of partner on this project where they're taking a piece of land where the river that had gone through the property um, was taken out. It was redirected. So um, instead of meandering through the property, the river became a straight line across the road from the property. So the river was now on the other side of the street in a straight line. <laughs> Um, and so their project actually is to redirect the river. So to let it go back onto the property, to meander through the property and to rehydrate it um, using cattle management practices um, and then also bring back habitat for the salmon. Um, so it's, it's a super cool project um, and there's a lot of really interesting economic incentives that I won't go into. Um, that were brought into play, um, but uh, it's fantastic to kind of see this work going on um, that benefits, you know, all of the stakeholders in the area. Congratulations, Congratulations on that, Esther. Esther. And Angie and hasn't Angie. come to kick us out yet. So Nick, do you want to tell us a story? Uh, I'll give you a quick one here because I know we're running out of time. Um, I think, you know, one story which everybody knows that I go back to just because I think it inspires long-term thinking is Stonyfield. It was founded in 1983, and you know it was recently sold to Lactalis, and the you know it was it was released at the time that they had 370 million of revenue. And if you look back, there wasn't that much data on organic sales back in the 80s, but in 1990 there was the number of a billion dollars and a 20% growth rate. If you work backwards, 1983 was under 300 million if that rate held that whole time. So in 1983. In you know dairy, which was not the predominant organic carrot category then, it, the largest was fruits and vegetables, as you'd expect. You know, a company was founded which ultimately had more revenue than there was entire organic market sales at the time of its founding. And I think as we look forward with Regen, if you think about the adoption rate on follow-on technologies, look at things like CD players versus VCRs and things like that. These things flow more quickly, and we have the internet and powerful tools to accelerate that. I think that's very inspirational and in looking forward to what life is going to be like in five or 10 years. Fantastic. I want to thank each of you for the incredible work that you're doing to help create 
uh, more regenerative food out in the marketplace. Thank you so much for your input.